The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie McGee with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's webinar. The title of the webinar is From Start to Sustainability, How to Have a Successful Grant Project. I will introduce our speaker shortly. Next slide, please. Before we get started, um, I just want to read this quick disclaimer. The Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and it is administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide, please. A quick note about the APS TARC. We're here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us. Contact information will be displayed at the end of the webinar. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Next slide, please. The APS TARC works with the National Adult Protective Services Association, or NAPSA, to present monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, and managers and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues and concerns facing APS programs today. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you would want to attend. Registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you are not a listserv member and would like to receive the registration information. Next slide, please. The APS TARC and the Administration for Community Living have compiled resources to support the work of APS professionals during the COVID-19 pandemic. This information, some of which was provided by state and local APS programs, is available on the APS TARC website at this link. Next slide, please. This session is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date. We will notify all attendees via email when it has been posted online. You may use your telephone or your computer to connect to audio. Just select the option you prefer on your GoToWebinar control panel. An example is displayed here and where you can make your selection is circled. Please be aware that participants will not be muted by the presenters for today's webinars. Please mute your phone or your computer mic to ensure that background noise is kept to a minimum and all speakers are able to be heard. Next slide, please. This is intended to be an interactive discussion. However, if you prefer to submit your questions in writing, you may simply type them in the question box. An example of where to type is posted on this slide in circle. You do not have to wait until we pause for questions to submit yours. You may type them at any time, and I will relay them to the speakers when it's time for questions. Handouts from the pre presentation will be provided after today's event. Next slide, please. Now I would like to introduce today's speakers. Our presenters today are Laura Rath, a Senior Program Officer with the Archstone Foundation, and Mary Toomey, a consultant with the APS TARC. I will now turn this over to Mary and allow them both to tell you a little bit more about themselves. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Leslie. Hi, everyone. It's Mary Toomey. I'm really um, happy to be here with all of you to um, be talking about the issue of um, you know, running a successful grant program, project management, things like that. Unmuted. That makes me think that you can't hear me. Okay, sorry, we had a technical difficulty there, but um, you guys should be unmuted now, Mary. We can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, because I was telling some really bad jokes. And, <laughs> God, that, you all missed my of course bad jokes. All right, I'll start again. I, I'll start again. Um, so I don't know what you heard, but hey, everybody, this is Mary Toomey, and I'm really happy to be here today. Um, um, so for those of you who, who I don't know, though I know many of you, and that's why it's so delightful to have this hour with you, um, I 
um, am a consultant in issues related to elder abuse, abuse of disabled adults, adult protective services, and have the pleasure of working with Andy and Leslie with the APS TARC. Um, and uh, before I was doing that, I was at the Administration for Community Living in the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services, working with the team there. And before that, I was at the National Center on Elder Abuse. So I um, have dedicated my career to this issue that I know is so close to all of our hearts. And um, let me turn it over now to let Laura Rath introduce herself. Laura is, I'll, I'll, I'll preface all of this to say that I've, I've known Laura for a long time and Laura is one of my favorite people in the world. Laura. <laughs> well, you are too kind, Mary, and it's just my privilege um, to be here to speak with all of you today. Hi, I'm Laura Rath, as Mary said, and um, if Mary Toomey calls um, with a question, you say yes. <laughs> so I'm just so glad to be um, having this conversation um, with all of you today, and I'll start with a little bit uh, about myself. Um, I um, was the coordinator of the Orange County Elder Abuse Forensic Center during its initial three-year startup out here in California um, and had the great pleasure of working with um, Dr. Mosqueda and Dr. Carrie Burnight um, on that project during its um, initial implementation. And I handled, um, I would say, the administrative portion, but also reporting. And then for the past 15 years, I've just had the real distinct privilege and honor of being a program officer with the Archstone Foundation in Long Beach, California. And Archstone is a private grant-making organization dedicated to improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. Um, and then I'll add in too that for the past four years, um, Archstone was very generous and gracious and supported me um, in also returning to school to work on my PhD. Um, and my research interests um, while I was back in school um, was focused on supporting family caregivers. So again, it's an honor to be here to um, talk with all of you, although I also told Mary um, I've seen most of the, the grant side of my career from um, the grants administration and program officer side um, and less time from um, the, the grantee side, but happy to be here. Thank you so much, Laura. And just a little bit of background. When I, when I first went to ACL to work as a program officer, having been unlike Laura, having been mostly on the side that all of you are on, which is writing grants to support, you know, innovative programs to serve clients, uh, especially older adults and adults with disabilities. I called Laura and said like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be doing something completely different. What are the sort of, what are the things I should know? Sort of what are the three most important things or what's the first thing I should do when I'm talking to a new grantee? And she was, was very helpful to me. And, um, I mean, I think where I wanted to start by way of introduction to this whole topic is, you know, project management is, it's, it's tricky because it's both an art and it's a science. So there's, it requires, you know, hard skills like time management and budgeting, but it also really requires those soft skills like um, motivating people and building a team and conflict resolution. And, you know, I think there are some people who really focus on the we must we must do everything by the book and have this done on time and it must be done the way it was exactly how it was written in the grant proposal we submitted um, and then there are people who have more of the skills that will never be on time but their their team is going to be super happy and this is what you know this is why I think project management is both an art and a science it's it's really a unique combination of all of those skills and if one of the things I wanted to talk about, I know, is like if you don't have one of those skills that's necessary for successful project management, is how do you how do you find someone else and build a team that where somebody else does? But but so basically, like there's no right way to do project management, but I think there are some basic principles that I know I wish that I had somebody had told me back when I was writing my first grant and getting um getting money to to undertake a project. Um, so you also have a lot of experience. If you're on this call, you already have an ACL grant. You might have had more than one ACL grant. Perhaps you've also had other grants. And of course, you have tons of other project management skills, which is why we wanted today to not be Laura and, 
and myself sort of expounding on in a didactic, you know, pedantic format, but really wanted to have this be a conversation between the two of us, Laura and myself, but really a conversation with all of us, which is why you're not muted. And, and so we would be grateful for, for your examples. We would all learn from your examples as we move forward. I mean, I think what, what's true about Laura and myself is that we have this unique experience of having been both grantees and grantors. Um, but we definitely do not have all the answers. Um, and so Mary, I'll just one echo other that red... jump in. Please. Yeah, and just uh, yeah, and just really echo that. I think in preparing for this, we really did talk through the art and science of it. So there are no necessarily hard answers, but we can certainly share um, and will today share some of our experiences and approaches. And just as Mary said, we'd love to hear from all of you as well because you bring a wealth of experience um, to this topic too. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, and uh, this, my other um, random thoughts is, I actually realized this morning that project manager probably starts when you write your grant. And we can talk a little bit more about that. that but that was just sort of one random thought, and I would love if people don't agree with that. <laughs> um, like, really, no, it has to start when you get the money. Um, that would be something fun to talk about. And then the other thing that I'll probably, I wanted to share that I had a thought about, which is every project reflects a vision that you have for your program. So whether it's something that seems pretty basic, like you're very cut and dry, like we want to update our data management system or we want to create a new intake tool, even though that specific project or task feels very cut and dry, they are reflective of a vision that you have for your APS program. And I feel like that's, to me, that's really important because I don't think, I think the vision sustains us even as we're like dealing with the difficulties of reporting on this project to back to ACL or doing all the other, the more hard, the more sciencey parts or, you know, con you know re resolving a conflict, the vision recognizing that this project reflects a vision that you have for your APS program, I think would, it would help me, it would sustain me. So the way we are organizing, next slide please, um, today's presentation is this, we have three questions. Um, and the first, we have, so we have three questions. What's the most important thing you think someone should do um, in getting a new grant? And I'll tell you what the other ones are, but don't, don't change the slides, um, anybody. Uh, what are the signs that grantors look for to know if a project is going well? And that what are some things you can do to ensure sustainability after grant funding is done? So those, that's kind of how we have organized today. And um, we're going to start with this question one. In conversation format, I wanted to ask you, Laura, um, what, is, what is the most important thing or things that you think a new somebody who you've just given a grant to should be should be doing as they're as they're just first receiving the grant funding yeah that's a great question and thanks Mary and I love your framing too of you know the grant really started when you were writing the application um, and with that vision of what um, change for the agency or change in practice that you were seeking um, of course, congratulations to you all. You now have the grant, um, and so things are full steam ahead. Um, of course, the world has changed in really profound ways, um, probably since you first had that vision um, of what your project um, would be. So I would say, you know, just kind of starting at the beginning um, for me was always um, looking back and saying, oh, what did we write now that we got the money? You know, I'm thinking back to when I was working with the Forensic Center and some of the training grants um, that came in, but going back um, really and getting concrete about the activities that were proposed um, and looking through to say, um, what's that scope of work? Um, what are the deliverables um, that we've promised? And then I think, um, What's important to note too is thinking about any things um, maybe that have changed or need to change um, since you got the money and having that conversation 
um, with your program officer um, or your funder. And I think, you know, now in my time with the foundation, um, that's something that we certainly, you know, really come to expect um, is that it is an ongoing dialogue with um, our grantees and with the projects that we fund. Um, we, we do view it as a partnership and that's a value um, that we certainly um, hold dear at the Archstone Foundation um, is that the conversation continues from the application um, through the execution of the project. Um, Mary, do you have some thoughts on the first thing? I just remember getting grants and having the, the time from the time you wrote the grant to the time you found out you got the money be a significant enough time that we were like, oh my God, what did we say we would do? Yeah. And recognizing, and this is something that I, I, I really think that ACL is very, very good at making it clear to grantees that, that the purpose of the program officers is not just a monitoring, like, you know, are all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed. It's really, it's in the best interest of the government that you succeed. And so the program officer's role is to you know, really support you, including in that very first moment when you look back and say, why did we put every single thing into this proposal? Every single thing we thought we could do. I remember reviewing a proposal um, as a, when, when other people were reviewing a proposal. It was not a proposal. But reviewers saying they put too much into this can't do all of this for the money that they've asked for. And going back to the grantee, the successful grantee, and saying, you know, we, we would like you to maximize your impact, not and do more, fewer things really well and impactful uh, than more things in a maybe a more diffuse or diluted way. And so to take a really, to take a really, um, careful look at what did you say you would do and make sure that it's all, yeah, I totally agree with you, Laura. Make sure that it's it's something that still works for, um, that nothing has changed in the environments around you, but also mm -hmm. did you overcommit? And this, this is the time to negotiate back to say, this task that we said we would do on page three, that task isn't as important to us now. We would like to do this other task instead. And, you know, obviously, this is a negotiation you, with the government, and but I think as long as it's in the mission of what you were proposing and the vision of what you were proposing, there's a lot of flexibility. So yes, what did we say we would do and what does the funder expect? Um, I mean, the next thing I guess for me would be something about um, understanding the timeline. I mean, there are times where grants, you get notice of a grant award and the grant has already the grant year has already started so that's not uncommon where the grant year started you know september 30th and you find out about it in november um so you're already your timeline is already 30 days old um 30 days you're 30 days behind um but putting those you know putting report dates on your calendar um, getting a clear picture of how the timeline needs to be adjusted. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about. Yeah, no, I think time. that's a, absolutely. I think that's really critical, and certainly the first thing I would always do as someone who, um, in my role as the coordinator, um, had to keep on top of reporting and making sure that the report deadlines um, were hit. So that usually meant for me, like. Put, inputting all of those report deadlines um, into my calendar. And then for me, thinking about, um, you know, tracking backwards, like who do I need to get information to write that, you know, who do I need to get information from to write the report? And who do I need to send it to to sign off on before it is submitted um, to the funder? So building in um, time for that as well. And then also I would say certainly at the foundation though, we hear, you know, all the time though, we do understand that sometimes um, even with all of that planning, that sometimes reports are late um, for a variety of reasons. And um, I always just appreciate it when I hear from um, a grantee prior to the deadline, um, just to say, hey, we need another week or two weeks. Um, and then for us, at least at the foundation side, it's really easy just to put that um, into our system, but at least I know it's 
coming. And I'm not sure though if um, federal government or ACL has a different approach, but I would just certainly emphasize the communication back to your program officer. Yes, absolutely. And um, you know, the next one of our next questions is sign, the signs that a project is going well. It's it's that that there is open communication that the grant the grantee is telling you we're going to be late. I think that's um, obviously everyone wants the reports on time, and I do think it is a little bit of a bellwether that a project is going well that that reports are coming in on time. But yeah, having been on the ACL side, it's not it's not a litmus test that is so significant but letting somebody know that the that you're aware i remember laura you having to call me when i was a grantee an <laughs> archstone grantee at the university of california i like you know your 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 report's a month late what oh my god <laughs> you know and okay. i would have, i would be the first to say the project was going swimmingly the project was <laughs> awesome um, i just had not yet um done which another thing that i think is one of the first things people should do i had not put a team around you know created the team where somebody else had the job to tell me what you just said like it should have, i should have created because that is not a skill set i have um like things like calendaring <laughs> um it's not my hard skills uh that's, that's one i have a, a deficit about so you know what I what what happened over time is we got the great Elaine Chen, who started um, working with us, and she had all of the you know she's I used to joke that Elaine was the executive functioning part of our office, and so she would create she created the calendar that tickled me so it said you know the report is due in 30 days 29 days 28 days 27 days <laughs> whatever. Um, well, Mary, I'll say that, I certainly I think, remember you and the whole project as stars. So I think that's great. Yeah, it's finding the right person on your team who does care and whose skin starts to get itchy if they're behind on a report. And, um, you know, definitely assign that task, um, you know, to the right person um, on your team. And I think that's maybe one of the next um, things that we were thinking about as well, if I can jump in, um, in terms of what to do at the beginning, and you've mentioned this too, but that's putting together putting together the right team. Like, who did you say would be involved, but you know, now is there a gap um, in your skill set or in that team? Um, and how do you need to round out um, that skill set for the project management piece and then also the implementation of, um, of the deliverables that you've promised? And Mary, yeah. this is Andy Capehart with the ABS TARC. One thing along those lines that <clears throat> I just thought of and is one thing that I've thought of when I've started grants before um, is to make sure you have the right tools in place. Mm -hmm. And by tools, I mean software mm -hmm. or whatever you need. I mean, if you're doing something about data, then you, know, you really want to look at what software you have to run the numbers. I know that I've... Um, I try to get really organized at the beginning of a grant and there's the whole task list thing in Outlook. Most of us probably use Outlook um, where you can plug in, you know, a task that you have to do and you can set that a year in advance if you want to. So if you go in and put all of those, you know, milestones or all of those tasks or when reports are due, that sort of thing in your task list, which is a good thing to get familiar with at the beginning of a grant. Um, you know, if you do that, say eight months in the future, you know, your computer is going to tell you what you need to do when it's time for you um, to do that sort of thing and remind you ahead of time. I think that can be really helpful. Yeah, that's a great point, Andy. And I know I did look into some project management software because, I mean, when I was at, we were at the National Center on Elder Abuse, and before that, the Center of Excellence on Elder Abuse and Neglect, we would have like five grants or more going at one time. So you had different report dates, different, yep. um, you know, deliverables for each project. Um, and definitely, I, as I looked into it, it was not, I think a task list in Outlook is a great idea. And calendaring ahead, as Laura, and, you know, suggested too. But yes, there is definitely, there are definitely tools that can help one do this and you know everybody needs to find the unique tool that works for them but that, but and, and related to teamwork which is its own kind of tool your team um one of the things that i 
recognized when I was working with ACL is in many, many APS programs, the ACL grant was the first grant, you know, from a funder that they were receiving, obviously, the, the money that they were getting from the state is a different thing, but this was the first external money. And because of that external money hitting them for the first time, there were um, relationships that they had never needed to build with like if there was a state office of grants management or a HHS or Department of Aging office of grants management, the office of finance or IT, depending on your project. And I remember mm -hmm. being really surprised, but then not surprised at all that I would be talking to new grantees and they would be saying, we don't know anybody in grants management, mm -hmm. in the office of grants management. We've never had to. So I remember saying to several <laughs> grantees of mine, I mean, this sounds, I don't know, I hope this doesn't sound sexist, but make cookies and make them. These people are, I mean, when, when, peop, when grantees needed to make reports, they couldn't, they, because there was no relationship, there was no team, these people were not part of the team, they hadn't, they didn't really understand the project, they just knew that you were asking them for this data, and you were like the 11,000th person who had asked them for data that day. and. <laughs> Um, how to so how so part of the team building or part of the tools is these relationships with other parts of your structure that you may not have had reason to interact with and I remember I just remember saying to people figure out who those people are because they they need to be your new best friend um, and Mary this is Andy again just one other thing I thought of um, it building rapport with the people, everybody on the team. I mean, I've been involved with grants where you get letters of support from someone and they're going to participate, but they may not know each other, all those different people. And so kind of getting them all together yep. at one time and making sure they know each other and can just pick up the phone very easily can be really helpful. And I'll just jump in and, you know, piggyback on that and say that I agree. That's so important. And I definitely went to the Mary Toomey School of, you know, bring a basket of cookies or muffins um, and bring those around to the other departments. Or for us, it was, you know, because we had weekly team meetings for the forensic center and the multidisciplinary team that we were running. Um, but beyond that, too, I definitely remember um, you know, I worked for UC Irvine, but um, my desk, my cubicle was um, embedded in APS, which was wonderful um, in terms of building those relationships um, and just taking time to listen um, to the APS social workers, um, what the challenges were in their work. And, um, you know, I think for us really thinking about um, a customer service approach to that team building, like that we were, we were there to help and to help make their jobs easier, help them achieve um, their goals for the agency. Um, and that's how we really tried um, to fit in and assist. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in a way, that kind of leads me to another thought that I had last night, which is identifying barriers. So just, just like you're, you're reminding yourself, what did we say we would do in this grant proposal? You know, some sort of um, sort of fierce moral <laughs> inventory of who who is likely to help us in this, who are the partners, and who is potentially um, going to be somebody who either by dint of their role, by dint of their personality, um, because you know, you're asking for an ex exception uh, or an exemption from a particular policy. So who is someone who, or something that might create a barrier to your success? Um, and being just really honest, instead of going in thinking, this is just gonna be a piece of cake, are, is there anyone who's gonna be a barrier to this? Because um, I can imagine, Laura, back to the forensic center and building that forensic center, where no, nobody had ever done that before. So you have doctors in the room talking to APS workers, talking to uh, law enforcement, and you know I'm sure there were lots of discussions about confidentiality and HIPAA, and, and just if you kind of went in and didn't recognize that that could be a barrier, then, you know, then you're surprised. But if you go in recognizing like this, 
this could be a barrier. We, here's how we have the answer. We have the answer to this question already about how are we sharing information. We're going to have confidentiality forms that are required to be signed by everyone upon entrance. Everything in the case that's distributed during the meeting will be recollected and shredded. You know, so you've, you've created, you've identified the barrier and sort of done whatever you can to work around it ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that certainly was um, our experience. Like you say, it was the first time any of these agencies were, um, you know, sitting around the table and really being asked to work together in that way instead of just, you know, handing off pieces to it um, in a stepwise fashion. Um, and that was, you know, there were folks, I think, who were bought into the vision right away. Um, and then other agencies where the relationship development um, you know, took longer, but um, was certainly, you know, worth it. And I do think it comes back to that relationship building um, and putting the time in at the beginning to understand um, how, you know, we could best help um, their agency um, and, you know, with their casework. So coming in, um, again, trying to, to help, but not add to their workload. Um, and then that right. just reminds me of the data piece as well, if I could um, jump to that. So yep. as a program officer now at Archstone, um, yeah, we certainly want to hear um, how it's going and to think about, as Andy was saying, like the tools that you'll need to capture um, the data. And we like to hear certainly about outputs, um, but also um, outcomes of, of what you're doing. So, you know, a lot of times we'll get um, progress reports now at the foundation that say like, oh, we had these meetings um, on these dates and that's great. And then as a program officer, what I'm always looking for is what happened as a result um, of those meetings? You know, was there a change um, to program or practice um, that happened as a result? You know, what are those next steps? Um, kind of what are the concrete outcomes? And, and sometimes, you know, that's hard um, to know when you're in it um, and hard to capture. Um, but I think, you know, over the long-term horizon, that's really what we're interested in um, on, the, on the funder's side. Yeah, and I, I'm, I know that that's more and more um, on any funder's side, something that they're looking for. So, so many APS workers were trained on fill in the blank. Um, and of course, that day you might ask your workers, what, what's your feeling about this training? You know, was it, did it flow at the right pace? Was the speaker knowledgeable? And so that's all good, good, good. But, you know, can you, when you're, when you're conceptualizing the idea of training workers on whatever, let's say dementia, then did you, did you build in that six months later you went back to workers and asked them, did you feel more competent working with clients who seem to have cognitive impairment? Did you, do you feel more equipped to do that work? Did you feel like you picked up signs of dementia more easily after the training? So I, those are just some ideas, like just asking your workers. It's so hard. I mean, the, the holy grail of APS outcomes is actually how did it, how did practice change or how did the client experience change and we're still learning how how we can do that and it's you know there's it's it's not beyond the reach of an of the APS program to do client outcome work but it is and I'm certainly not an expert on it at all so <laughs> be careful what I say but but I totally agree with you Laura and speaking you know, knowing from my time at ACL that this is the direction that people are moving in. It's not just enough to say that you train so many workers, what happened as a result of that for the, in the worker's life, in, in the worker's practice. Uh, and then obviously one day we'll, we'll have a better sense of how it, maybe how it changed, you know, for the client, the client's experience. So I think um, and that, that sort of moves into, you know, a little bit about, I think one of the other things and then we can move to the second question is um you know just being able to 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 explain to people what your project is so what is like what is it that you're doing it's sometimes hard for projects especially if they have multiple multiple things happening at once to be able to create an elevator speech but being able to for the sake of teamwork for the sake of um talking to other departments 
and for the sake of, you know, for, for staff to understand, um, especially if things are being, are changing, uh, as a friend of mine said, her husband says to her all the time, change not good for Dave. And <laughs> I know that there are lots of APS workers who think change is good, and then there's others who are like, change not good for APS. So how, you know, if you're changing something like new intake, new training, new data management system that's requiring workers, how are you communicating that? I, I saw one of my grantees, I thought just did a fabulous job, seemed like um, using different, several different modalities in communicating what the project was about. They had a newsletter that went out to all staff, and so there were regular a little corner on, on the project, a little updating all staff whenever they had all staff meetings. There was a report on this. Um, they convened a sort of stakeholder group of workers from out from throughout the state who had, um, you know, had the opportunity to give input on the project. Um, lots of different ways that that everybody at all levels um, was in, able to see the value of the project, understand the vision of the APS program and how this project fit into that vision. And I think that something that sometimes gets lost when you have a project because especially if you think you know because if you if you're focusing just on like the the pieces that need to be done um nobody really wants to know all the pieces that you're going to do in this project what they want to know is how is this going to make a difference and how to i mean that's just me i want to know that i want to know Maybe your higher ups need to know we're going to do these four steps, but how how do you communicate the vision of this project and how you hope it changes things? Um, that I think that can also help with sustainability. But let's go to question two. So, oh, let's question the next slide. On the next slide, we kind of um, put some of the things uh, that we just addressed: um, revisiting the scope timeline outcomes, teamwork, communications, keeping track of progress. Um, and so we just wanted to do that for you so you'd have that. <clears throat> but the next question was really um, starting with you, Laura, like signs that are, and, and also I know we're talking a lot and I hope like Andy, some of you might just, you're not on mute. So please jump in if you have, if you have an example of something that you feel like you've done or a comment, go ahead. And, oh, sorry, Mary. And this is Andy, uh, the, your technical yep. guru for the day. I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody now. We had some problems a minute ago. And we were trying to unmute everyone. So just to FYI, we are going to um, unmute you. You will have the ability to mute yourself if you'd like to at any point. Um, and if you're still having trouble or if you're wanting to talk, just send me a message and I'll make sure that you're unmuted. So back to you, Mary. Okay. So your dog is welcome on the call. I used to have a cat that I think in its old age was developing either deafness or dementia or both. And I remember being on some like wildly important call and the cat is like, rawr, rawr. <laughs> is somebody's cat dying? So your your animals and others are welcome on the call. So don't don't be shy. Definitely. Before we go to this next next slide, um, I mean, please go to the next slide. But before we take up the, the content of the next slide, did anyone want to comment on um, sort of do this first, something that you did first that you, you want to make sure others know about? Also, we didn't um, say celebrate because there's a good way to put a poor opportunity. <laughs> I'll always be looking for opportunities to celebrate. The fact that you've got a grant is like, woohoo! That should always be um, acknowledged and celebrated. So, but this next, like, for, for, from the perspective of a grants officer, um, Laura, uh, signs that a project is, is going well. What are you kind of looking out for? Yeah, and thanks, Mary. And I think we sort of um, have touched now on some of the points that we'll return back to um, from our first question. Um, but this is, again, that idea of open and honest um, communication, I think, is first and foremost. So, um, you know, if a report is late, as Mary said, it, that's not really necessarily about weather. But um, if I'm hearing, you know, regularly or hearing ahead of um, if like a report will be late or hearing ahead of a problem or when a problem or barrier is encountered, um, 
that uh, the project has reached out to me to let me know, you know, what they're planning to do to address it, um, or if it's something, you know, that requires um, revisiting the scope um, or the budget, um, that they're working with us um, at the foundation to make those changes. Um, and the other um, part I would say that's really helpful as a program officer is if I'm able to clearly follow along in the reports um, and map that directly back to the scope of work and um, the deliverables that were in um, the grant as it was written. Um, and if there's that congruency, um, that's always a sign um, for me as a program officer that things are going well. If I get a report, but it's not necessarily on topic um, or hasn't um, addressed the key issues of the, the change or the work that they're trying to do, um, you know, that's where um, I'll be following up um, as a program officer. How about for you, Mary? What do you look for to know that if a project's going well? Um, well, both of those things, I remember a grantee who, you know, we would have a regularly scheduled call and I just was, the person just would not call, that state just would not call. And I remember thinking, <laughs> I, I don't know, like, what's going on? Is this, this yeah. mean, is this bad? They don't like me. Uh, of course, I go to like, they don't like me first. Um, but they, you know, and it, 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 I don't think it always means that something's going wrong with the project, but I, I think it it certainly raised alarm bells when there was just nothing you know, silence on the other end. Um, I learned later, you know, because of course I I called and say like, what's going on? It turns out this person um, had to do everything for the grant when they were <laughs> subcontracting with a local university. She had to write the contract. Like she had no support whatsoever. Um, mm -hmm in like it was everything that the proposal said that the state would do was being done by basically one person and so sort of going back to teamwork mm -hmm. or getting buy-in from support and uh, from others um there was just a huge steep learning curve and talking <laughs> and i think what happened over time is that i think she began to trust that she could tell me that things were going that things were very difficult and in not in a bad way she wasn't trashing anybody or uh, she was just making it clear some of the barriers that she was encountering and i think that some of the early time when uh, a call was missed a check-in call was missed was partly because I, I think she was afraid to say this is what is going on with us and i again over time and i know this Again, their part of their job is to. It, it, it's in the best. Again, it's in the best interest of the government who has already invested this money that you succeed. And so, part of that is to be as honest as possible with the program officer about the um, barriers that the project is encountering and problem solve with, you know, with her about how to make it better. Um, I, I think adjustments are better than hiding the ball and not telling the program officer what's going on. So there, some of those things about reports not coming in on time, calls not coming in on time, can, can be just inefficiency or disorganization, but I think some of them are um, maybe these other barriers. But there, they are things to, um, certainly things that piqued my interest in that, in that project. Um, and also, yeah. you know, you, I think, oh, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to jump in and really um, agree with that. Um, you know, we have a project um, right now. Um, for us, it's in our depression care work. And they, um, I would say, have really struggled with the enrollment piece. Um, so in tracking the reports, you know, we saw that they weren't um, really hitting their target numbers in terms of how many clients they would be serving. And um, that was an opportunity for us um, to schedule some additional calls um, with that site, and it's still ongoing. Um, but what we were able to do was help them make some changes to their protocol. Um, because just as Mary said, same with the foundation money. You know, once we've invested um, in a program, we want to see it succeed um, as well. So it's in our best interest, um, as well as the projects, to see, you know, 
what's changed or how do we need to um, tweak, in this case, it's the enrollment protocol um, to make sure that, um, you know, they're still meeting the spirit um, and the vision of the project, just as we've been talking about, um, but making changes in practice to make it possible. Yeah, and I think similarly adjustments are expected and um, several of the grantees that I worked with had changes in leadership. I remember one state, every single person above the work, the person who was the, the grants, who, who was managing the grant for that state, every single person in her line of command um, above her left, mm -hmm. like the month that she got the notice that they had gotten the award. Mm -hmm. And I mean, of course, there's, that's going to create a huge delay in terms of getting buy-in. I mean, certain things could happen, but other things couldn't happen without buy-in from the leadership, which had not been, uh, had to be put in place. And that's, those are okay. It's really just about communicating back um, to the program officer. Sometimes, too, um, you would see, like, again, you know, there's a delay between the time you write the proposal and the time you get the money. Maybe something that you said you were going to do in that time, you learn that another state has already done it. You're going to create a, a great worker safety protocol. I'm making this up. And then you find out, oh, Louisiana did that and they're sharing it and we just need to tweak it. So, you know, we're not, we would prefer, not we, the government would probably prefer not to pay you to do something that's already been done and can be, uh, but, but what else could you do? How do you build on? So what opportunities may have come your way that make you think, oh, this original idea was a good idea and the government liked that idea, but, um, but here's actually a better idea um, to, to share um, and we're going to leverage this other opportunity over here. So again, just this, this um, and going back just briefly to the idea that the project proposal is part of project management, um, I saw a lot of times where timelines were ridiculously uh, optimistic. Like, oh, we're going to yeah. hire Always. someone to run this. Uh, yeah. We're going to hire somebody. It's, a, it's in the project. The project money, we expect the money September 1. By October 1, the project yeah. timeline says, you know, Susie will be hired. I'm like looking at it going, where do you work that you can get somebody on board in 30 days? So obviously adjustments are going to need to be made because but but maybe maybe the thing to do was to have your proposal actually acknowledge the fact that in our state it takes six months to onboard somebody. Um, maybe you're afraid that grantee is not going to like that, uh, grantor rather is not going to like that. So maybe maybe you don't say six months, but you say four months, but don't say thirty days, mm -hmm. um, because you know. But anyway, as long as you're honest, back to the funder, I think that um, those that's what I was looking for. Are you? are you forthcoming with information? Um, I would rather have you be forthcoming and, and, and uh, make adjustments than find out later that something sort of difficult was going on and um, I wasn't aware of it. Mary? Yeah. Um, I'll yeah, just, hello, I'll just, excuse me. Oh, go Laura, ahead, Laura and Mary, I just wanna check in with you guys. We only have about 10 minutes left. And we still want to get to our okay. third question. And we also have a comment from a per, from um, one of the attendees that I want to share before we wrap up. Okay. Do you want, um, Laura, do you want to say what you're going to say and then maybe hear the comment? Yeah, that's great. I think this will wrap it up, which is on this question, which is just to say, we now expect that there will be personnel changes and timeline changes. And that's sort of um, built in to our understanding of how all projects are going to run. We don't know what the change will be, but we know it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> so well, thank the, you. Uh, the comment that we received was actually on the first question. It was a first thing to do suggestion. And the recommendation please. was, kickoff meeting with upper management budget procurement team to remind all of the project all of the project details and confirm the commitment of staff and resources from each to see it through so that was kind of actually applicable to some of the things you were just talking about that's a fabulous idea yeah, yeah, I absolutely think that's, great idea that's great yeah and we see that sometimes um, in site visits and I think 
um, that'll bring us really to our next question um, as well. Um, but as a program officer attending a site visit, sometimes you get a sense too, like is this the first time everyone's met? <laughs> How many times have they met before? Um, and then that kickoff meeting, hopefully um, you can sustain that momentum and you know schedule, schedule whatever regular meetings um, with the appropriate people um, are needed um, to keep um, the relationships going um, and keep the momentum for the project. So, uh, Leslie, let's go to the next slide. Thank you, Laura. Um, or Andy. Okay, so this is just a little recap of what we said about signs that a project is going well. And then let's go to the next slide. Um, that's just a quick. So, yeah, the last thing we wanted to talk about um, is you know, some things that projects can do to ensure sustainability after the funding is, is over. And, um, Laura, do you mind if I just ask you that question? Are yeah, there, absolutely. Uh, things that you've seen? Go ahead. Yeah, well, for, yeah, for us, um, and we've said this already as well, which is sustainability really starts just as the project management starts when you're writing the grant. So does sustainability, you know, getting the buy-in um, from the right people, developing that clear mission and vision um, for the project, um, and then thinking about um, the change that you're seeking to make with the project or the grant um, and how you can um, internalize that into your your systems. Um, so, you know, what will change as a result of that project? Um, and how can you, you know, capture that um, along the way? Um, and that starts, yeah, really with writing the application and the time to think about sustainability um, is certainly at the beginning. Yeah, I, I feel like sustainability is one of those, like having written several grants, if we get to that part about how will you sustain the grant, it's a lot of it is just um, like wishful thinking, like <laughs> aspiration. We yeah. we will seek, you know, the things where I've seen it done well, or not done well, uh, where I've seen, especially for APS grantees, I feel like um, if along the way there has been the buy-in of leadership and if along the way you've documented the impact of the prog of your program, the project, in terms of both outputs and outcomes, in at least two grants that I'm aware of, the, the project got integrated into state budget. Yeah. And that, you know, is, it's a great, that's a great result of the government investing money to do something um, and then the state recognizing the, that um, the benefits of that project that you might not have been able to start the project without the, the ACL's funding but the state recognizes that that's a, you know that's an outcome that I think is really positive. Um, another thing though is I've also seen where some of the outcomes of the project are just integrated into practice. So, um, you know, if one of the things you were doing is um, something that that you needed money to to get started. So, for example, um, a project that was training sexual assault workers on working with um, adults with disabilities or older adults who were victims of sexual abuse. So that sometimes money brings people to the table even if they're not getting the money, but that everybody's like, oh, you have money to do that? You have a grant to do that? Oh, well, we'll come to your table, even though we're not going to get any of that money because we, we kind of get it. Uh, we get that we have to do something about that. And you have money now to help us at least, you know, come to the right room together to be together. And then, but then afterward, after that money was gone, that the project, the relationships that were built and the uh, interest in the project and the goals of the project, um, that, that still continued, even though the money from ACL was gone. So whether it goes onto a state budget because you actually have hired somebody that needs a salary, or just the the goals of the project are recognized as important, and then that work continues. That's a different kind of sustainability. Like it doesn't require ongoing resources. 
and that's the holy grail i'd say for foundations too you know i think often foundations have some seed money you know to try a new idea a new innovation um, and then you know what we want to hear or what we're looking for in reviewing proposals about sustainability um, isn't we'll seek another foundation grant because we know how hard that is um, but that's really what we're looking for is to see if um, that money for personnel could be incorporated um, onto, as Mary said, a state budget or um, a county budget. And that was certainly um, the case, which was so great with the medical response team um, in Orange County, was they were able to build um, that billing process into the county budget at APS. Um, and another example from our elder abuse work, um, where it was um, creating a curriculum for training on elder abuse um, for a mandated reporter population and then you know having that continue and that does require you know some funds and personnel to update um, but making sure that's embedded um, into the training requirements for those workers mm -hmm. I think that um, we could have a whole other webinar and in fact you, you may have already done this <laughs> Andy and Leslie with seeking other funds you know from VOCA um, other sources of uh, federal funds for program um, again you know in uh, mm -hmm. as there was a state that I'm aware of where they got an ACL grant started a pilot project and then applied using the the outcomes of the ACL funded project they applied for and got a two million dollar VOCA VOCA grant but so there are there is also that using the if you've documented your outputs and outcomes from the ACL project, if you've um, you know if you've figured out a way to tell the story of your project and how your project fits into a vision for your ACL for your APS program, you know that includes you know real life examples and um, then I think going to another source of funding is or back to ACL, depending on um, <laughs> what's going on with other sources of funding, that you you have um, getting one grant, the predictor of getting another grant is that you have one grant. Yeah. Um, so you know, yeah. to, to document what your progress is and your outcomes will help you get another grant if, in fact, another grant is what's needed. Um, so sorry, Andy, it looks, sounded like you were going to say something. Oh, uh, that was actually was someone else. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually Mrs. Leslie. Oh, sorry, Leslie. Um, we have about two minutes left, ladies. So um, can we look at this wrap-up slide for you mm -hmm. to, to summarize this last question and give our attendees one last opportunity to chime in with any questions or comments? I um, don't want to cut anybody off or run anybody's opportunity to speak up. Yeah. Okay. Any, uh, I would I would just say Leslie um, again. Thank you to the TARC for inviting Laura and myself to have this conversation in front of others, like dining with Andre. Um, <laughs> and um, also just to you know just to go back to sort of what I said at the beginning. It's an art and a science. Um, and the first thing we need to do is just congratulations that you're on this call that you got an ACL uh, grant. And congratulations also to ACL um, for having the kind of um, creating the kind of framework that allows you to succeed and that has you know gives you caring intelligent thoughtful program officers that are really interested in your success uh, because that's a it's a partnership your project's success is a partnership with ACL and um, you know I'm I am really proud of the work that ACL is funding and really proud of the work that ACL APS programs are doing all over the country. So okay. that's just my thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have put uh, Laura and Mary's contact information up on the slide for anyone who would like to reach out to them. Uh, again, we will be sending out a copy of the handout to all the attendees after today's event. Can you go to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is the contact information for the APS TARC. And you are also welcome and encouraged to reach out to us if there is anything that we can do or any questions or resources that we can help you 
get to um, regarding your APS program. I want to thank Mary and Laura again. I think this was extremely informative and helpful today. I appreciate you all's time and thank everyone else for attending. And we will be in touch with uh, additional grantee support activities. Everybody have a great and wonderful and safe weekend, please. Thank you. Thank Take you, care, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.